David T. Smith, welcome back to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me, and it's lovely to be here. Yeah, so we're going to dig into all things gin and tonic here in just a moment, but for our listeners who aren't familiar with you from your previous appearances here on the podcast, can you just refresh us on who you are and what you do? Yeah, so my name's uh, David T. Smith. A lot of David Smiths around, so that's why there's a T there. <laughs> um, I've been working in the drinks industry for about 12 years, something like that. Um, I do a lot of writing. I started off as a blogger, um, reviewing gins, but I'm, an, I'm interested in all elements of spirits now. So I spend some of my time writing, I spend some of my time helping to organise or judging for competitions. to so run a trade show for distillers. Um, in London called the Craft Distilling Expo and do some, teach some classes on gin and do some talks and things. Do a little bit of sort of helping people out with a bit of feedback on their spirits, but it's really just something I do because I'm interested in it um, more than any sort of paid consultancy kind of gig. It's quite an informal thing, but it's always fun because you always, that's a great way to learn. You know, someone says, oh, what do you think's the problem with this? And you have a taste, you chat about it and they come back to you and they say, oh yeah, it was that in the end. So very satisfying. Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, so getting, getting back to your writing, when I was thinking about whom I should contact to discuss this, I, I guess we can call it a trend, but it's, it's, I think it's, I think it's a bit more of a trend. It's, 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 it's a phenomenon, I suppose I would call it of the Spanish style gin tonic. Your mind immediately, or you, your name immediately jumped to mind because you have an entire book on this subject. So I, I didn't have to spend too, too much time racking my brain for my subject matter expert in this situation. Um, and, and I was trying to think about the best way to get into it. And I, I suppose maybe the best way to start talking about the Spanish style gin tonic is to talk about the gin tonic, maybe the, the history of the drink more generally or going back further in time. So is that something that you can do to kind of ease us into this subject? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, um, there's still work that needs to be done about the history of the gin and tonic, for sure. Um, I know, uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, uh, the early reference is something like 1850s, 1860s, uh, and it's from some record of some horse race or something, and they, the horse race is finished, and they're like, let's go, gin and tonics, brandy sodas, or something like that, and this is a reference that um, uh, Camper English found. Um, and... And that's kind of like the earliest reference of the two things together. And then actually finding more detail is a lot harder. Um, and with many of these things, you kind of slightly suspect this might be a more recent phenomena than we thought it might be. Because that this is like the first reference of the two things being together. And it's only, it was less than 200 years ago. So, you know, there's a reference point there. Um and then sort of, other than that, most of it is sort of 20th century. Yes, uh, tonic water existed. Yes, Schweppes were making it. And there's Erasmus Bond and there's all this kind of stuff. But actually, like people specifically talking about gin and tonic together is rarer than you would expect. Sometimes you hear people refer to gin with a grain of quinine in it, which I think is at this point... You could turn, so quinine comes from the chinchona bark. It's used to treat, um, in, in a way, it's used to treat malaria. It's, we could, that could be a whole separate thing. Anyway, but that's really, you know, that's why this bark was so valuable. And then essentially the quinine that is the thing that you want, you can extract it. You can make a sulfide out of the bark and you have these crystals. And basically it's sort of one crystal into a bottle of tonic water will give you the sort, the rough sort of dose. And it's very bitter. I think my thinking is like early on, it would have been served as a powder, the quinine, for the medicinal reasons, and then it might have been mixed with things. I think like a very early gin and tonic wouldn't have been the crystal clear thing that we would know of today. I think it would have been much murkier um, and, and things like that. There's only speculation, not really based on anything, but just thinking about what people had. I don't think that they were shipping out big bottles of tonic water around the the empire or wherever or out to India or wherever these far fun places are, because it just doesn't make sense when you're shipping stuff. So, um, so that's anyway, move to the 20th century. And I think really that was the time when the gin and tonic really sh shone. Um, even finding recipes very hard because it's easy, right? It's gin and tonic. So why do you need to write the recipe down? <laughs> um, I think one of the earliest ones I found, I 
think it's, it's I think it's from the either the late twenties or the early thirties, and it's an advert for Gilby's Gin from the Shepherd's Bar in Cairo, and that has a, they have a very specific way that they that they suggest having this gin made, um, and interestingly, it's with lemon and lime, which I think is quite fascinating. Mm. Yeah, that is interesting. I I appreciate the point about logistics here, right? Because it, it, when you come across historical references to some of these cocktails, sometimes it's easy to romanticize them and to you know take our take our our tinted lens, whatever tone your tint of the lens is, and, and imagine yourself back. Imagine a harp being played and you know there, there's there's time travel mentally and you go back to the golden age of the cocktail and it's tempting to imagine some of these things without dealing with like all right well how are we going to ship this much medicine halfway across the world yeah. and the answer is almost definitely in the most condensed light form possible and then when it gets to its final destination it becomes dressed up and that's when we have the opportunities to imagine things like you know, the gin tonic or punches and grogs and things like that in the, you know, the, the golden age of, of sailing. And it kind of strikes me because I was, I was trying when thinking about the gin and tonic, I was trying to think of other cocktails like it. And the only governing principle that I could come up with was simplicity, right? You just mentioned it. It's two things. It's, it's about as simple as a cocktail can get. But if you take the quinine out of the tonic water, really it's, three things. It's a gin. It's some sort of thing as a flavorant to cover and, and then to cover up that bitterness of the quinine. And maybe water was just sort of added a little bit separately. So I, I kind of think of that original instantiation of it almost like an old fashioned, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I, th I think I think that's that's fair enough. And certainly when I have, if I was going to make a early style gin and tonic which is just based on supposition as opposed to any evidence but it's a nice drink um that's what i will do so it will be it'll have the gin i'll have um some tonic syrup and then i'll have some citrus juice so in some ways it's a it's a bit like a gimlet or or like a daiquiri in some ways but i would serve it on the rocks and have it kind of but i mean of course they wouldn't have had it on ice there because they wouldn't have had it with a very occasionally they might have had ice but generally they wouldn't have had ice so you've also kind of got to think about that if you're lucky maybe you could find an unpolluted cool stream to add your water <laughs> to it <laughs> true true um so, all right, so that's good deep context for us. It kind of alerts us to the fact that the the gin and tonic before it became Spanish was a sort of early 20th century phenomenon that, that kind of grew. And, and you also, I mean, to, to me, when I think of a, a classic gin and tonic, it is served in a straight, tall Collins glass with, you know, a wedge of lime in it. It is not clear but it is it is not colored it is yep. relatively neutral in color and to me the carbonation seems to be one of the important things at play here and when i think about the history of carbonation carbonation wasn't really happening at scale until the early 20th century so if we're thinking about this gin and tonic as it existed in our cocktail consciousness really it's an early 20th century phenomenon when they first started scaling the carbonated you know you think of the the glass soda siphons and stuff like that when they finally started finding ways to export this and serve at scale with these types of drinks so knowing that like this is what we imagine a gin and tonic to be in the 20th century collins glass no color the only color being that, you know, that wedge of lime, uh, very refreshing is how I think of it. Am I missing any like attributes of like what we think of this, like prototypical gin and tonic before we move to Spain? I, th well, I think that there's a, even within that there's variation between what you would get in the U S and what you would get in the UK. And I would say, if you look at like today, even now, I, the, the, the gin and tonic in the UK is so much more popular as a portion of gin drink served in the UK than it is in the US. Um, but they are also, they've kind of gone their own slightly different ways as well. I mean, the US is a, I think really a, a, a stronger 
a history of highballs. And arguably, I mean, gin tonic is basically a, a highball, particularly if you're using a tonic syrup. You know, if you've got your gin and then you put your lemon or your lime juice in and then you put the tonic syrup in and then you put some, you know, soda water, seltzer water. I mean, what's the difference between the tonic syrup and the sugar syrup other than you've got this sort of quinine flavor? Um, so I do see like, there's almost you could argue like a sort of american style and and the idea of squeezing the citrus in there so the juice is in there that seems to be something that at least in my experience i see more when i'm drinking in the u.s than i do here largely because you're not necessarily going to get the fresh citrus here or if you do it'll be such a thin sliver that you won't you know i've seen people like prepare lemon generally it would have been but you know they prepare the lemon and they get all uh you know good like 16 slices out of one lemon you know it's 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 swapper thin <laughs> um but the other difference between the us and the uk is the prevalence of ice and so the us has had a much more great availability of ice and refrigeration and freezers particularly at home than you would have in the UK, I, I can't remember exactly the figure now, but it's something like by the late seventies, only half of UK households had a freezer. Mm, mm-hmm. So this is in compar- I can't remember what the figure is for the US, but you know we were slower adopters for freezers for sure. And actually, um, someone was telling me a, a story, an anecdotal story, but up until about late eighties, early nineties, it wasn't. This uh, this idea of having really cold gin and tonics and having really effervescent gin and tonics wasn't so known in the UK. Um, in the fact that, like, you if you went to a bar, or you went to a pub, usually it'd be a pub that you would go to, um, you would have a bucket of ice for everybody on the bar, and you'd be served your gin and your tonic. The tonic might not be put in the fridge, probably wouldn't be. And you would just add the ice yourself. And that ice would have just like come out of like a freezer tray. So once the ice was gone, the ice was gone. You just had a warm uh, gin tonic, which is why if you watch a number of British sitcoms from the late 80s, early 90s. So one pick of favorite of mine is um, As Time Goes By, which has got Dame Judi Dench in it. If you, people haven't seen it, do check it out. Um and they have, they drink quite a lot of gin and tonics, but the tonic water is always on the side and they have it in a, like a cut glass tumbler and they just put the gin in and the tonic is as warm as you like. And not sometimes I, not always, but that tonic is usually out. So it will be sweeter. It will be obviously warmer and it will be less fizzy. Um, and I, this is the sort of the story I heard recently was that, uh, uh Gordon spent a lot of money in the nineties going around encouraging bars to serve gin tonics on ice. And before that, it just wasn't so popular. But they had, like, there was a really big campaign to serve the, you know, had all the branded ice buckets and stuff, a really big push to serve um, gin and tonics on ice in the UK. Um, so we have those them to thank for that, <laughs> in that respect. Uh, different situation in the US, but in the UK, yeah. Even, even now, even now, you go around a friend's house, they might not have ice. I usually take my own ice. If I'm going around a friend's house and we're going to have drinks, I take my own ice. That's interesting. I've, <laughs> I've, I've only ever had to, I've, I've had to do that here in the U S but it was, it was just because it was a low quality person. Not, not, not because, not because that's a thing that a thing that I generally have to do is like, Oh no, I know I'm gonna have to bring my own in this particular instance. Um, that's, that's interesting. Um, I'm glad this is another sort of little perk of being able to have this conversation with you is because you take a historical and cultural perspective that is, you know, we're separated by a very large ocean. And so there's, there's some interesting differences that are coming out. And again, like this is, this is sort of the challenge for me of talking about the Spanish style gin tonic phenomenon, because I have this image in my mind of what a gin and tonic is, and it's very different than what many people, you know, imagine it to be certainly historically in the UK. And, and so can you, I, th- I think this takes us up to the doorstep. Can, can you it does. walk us, walk us into what happens in Spain? Yeah. Might be worth, shall I very briefly explain what a Spanish gin tonic style is just in case anyone, uh, yes, yes, just in case anyone doesn't know. So imagine a really big, 
wine glass, like a big burgundy glass or something like that. Um, something that like is bigger than the size. I mean, I've got quite a big fist, but you know, like, but bigger than the size of your fist, you know, a big glass anyway. Um, and, and in that would be absolutely full of ice right up to the top. And then you would have a decent measure of gin because it's quite a big glass, you know, and, and then you would top that up with tonic and then it would be garnished with very colorful or kind of ornate, um, whatever it might be, botanicals or citrus peel or something. But the big thing, I think, is the sheer size of the glass and the amount of ice. I mean, you're talking about, if you're talking inch cubed ice cubes, I think you're talking about eight, nine, ten to fill a glass, probably something like that. It's a, it's a decent size. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and that, and that's it really. Uh, the tonic water would be, cold and and there's there's a lot of theater that can go into it as well um and that's more something that you would get in spanish bars but as a as a concept of the thing that's different it's generally that it's a larger drink because it's at least a double measure but maybe more depending on where you are and that huge prevalence of ice which depending on where you are of course makes it harder or easier to make i mean it's certainly something that's easier to make in a bar than it is at home because it would take your whole ice tray from your freezer to make one drink mm, right it's interesting too i mean i don't want to belabor us too much on the subject of ice but you know I, i've seen pictures online it you know obviously with inflation and rising costs here in the u.s uh i've, I've seen people like snap photos of their drinks receipts and like they, they're actually being charged for ice. I'm sure it's nice ice really? that they're being charged for, but, you know, going back to that notion of, you know, the UK being slow to adopt ice, uh, this really does put us in the restaurant space. Like it, it, it makes it seem like this type of drink could not have originated outside of a very potentially high end space where they actually have time to. Oh, for sure. I, and that's where it came from. <laughs> right. So, so talk to us. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know the extent to which this has been like traced back to a single source or like a single person. But uh, as I understand it, it, it originated sort of like in the San Sebastian high end Michelin star culinary space. Is that is that accurate? Uh, yeah, I I had it. My, apologies, my geography, but um, the Basque region was where I was. Was, was, was where I had heard. Um, I've heard varying different things. Some people have said sort of 2010. Some people have said it was earlier than that, but I think it's this century. So it's in the 2000s. Um, and the, the story that I had heard, sadly not totally, um, uh, you know, nailed down was that it came from, uh, people wanting to have a refreshing drink in the kitchen. It was a, it was a chef thing. And so they take these big burgundy glasses um, because it wasn't a specific glass at the time. They would fill it with ice because it was a hot kitchen. So they needed to have all the ice and they'd make a gin and tonic with it. And then of course, if you are, if you come from a culinary background, if you wanted to garnish it, you would now, I think probably early garnishes might've been something like a bit of rosemary or something, but you know, that's kind of unheard of. <laughs> You know, for anyone else. I mean, we had lemon and lime and cucumber, and I, and cucumber goes back to the 70s because Seagrams were using it in an advert back in the 70s. But, like, other than that, you know, we didn't have a lot of of choice, Um partly because, you know, there are only so many things that a bar will stock or a pub will stock to to garnish a drink. You know, they're not going to keep watermelon just to garnish one gin tonic. It's ridiculous. So th there's an aspect to that. And then it gradually um spread throughout spain and then came over um to the uk and actually it's like it's not uncommon to have lots of different drinks served like that. you order a rum and coke you'll probably get uh it served in that in that in that kind of style and then it also became a way of kind of different bars to show off about the you know how how fancy it is and and the, and the theatrics of it as well i love that notion of like the kitchen versus the bar, right? You, you, you go behind most bars and if they have a garnish station, it is a sort of narrow tray. There's your lemon bin, your lime bin, and then maybe, you know, your, your, your cherries or something like that, or your oranges, whatever, whatever, what have you, but it's, it's not very big. It contains at most 
four or five potential garnishes and that's it. That's what you're, that's what you're working with. That's your entire toolkit. But then you just go through a swinging door and suddenly you have the keys to the castle. You have a, an entire walk-in freezer or refrigerator filled with, in the case of a Michelin star restaurant, you know, these, these amazing, you know, uh, venues in San Sebastian that people travel, you know, continents to go and, and simply have a, a single meal at, they've got the riches of the kingdom in these walk-ins most certainly. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that we're, that we've spent some time talking about, you know, you were mentioning a few moments ago about like the prevalence of citrus in the UK of just like people trying to get like as many little micro sections of these lemons as possible because they're so expensive and they're so, so hard to get. I remember in, I want to say like 2016 or 2017 at Tales of the Cocktail, um, when it's one of the team members from uh, White Lion or Dandelion in the UK was talking about the the instantiation for their citrusless, iceless program, that it was almost like a sustainability type thing. I'm like, yeah, it's it's almost slightly irresponsible for us here in the UK. If you think about the carbon footprint and the the expense of getting a single piece of citrus from where it originates here to the UK, like that's a, that's a big, that's a heavy lift. And so mm. uh, it, it's just interesting talking about the actual, the, the citrus of it and the, the things that aren't the gin and aren't the tonic. Because to me, when I think of a Spanish gin and tonic, the gin and the tonic are almost in the back seat when compared to, like you mentioned, the ice and those, those garnishes. And the one thing that kind of strikes me as a, as a huge affordance here that isn't generally done or wasn't really done much before was the opportunity to almost do a in-glass infusion with some of these ingredients. So can you yeah. talk about some of the things that are often not just garnished on top as we think of like a, like a twist or something like that, but actually infused into the, the drink itself frequently? Yeah, um, and it's actually one of the drinks in the book. Um, so... Uh, we know, you know, tea, there we go, it's another British thing, um, <laughs> it infuses very well in hot water, also infuses really well in booze. Uh, <laughs> so one of the drinks that, I, that I've got is um, you put your gin in this big glass, then you get an Earl Grey tea bag because you want that sort of bergamot sort of flavour, and you infuse it for maybe 30 seconds, and then you take it out, and then you've got this gin that's infused with the Earl Grey. But, I mean, you can use any sort of flavour tea bag that you like whether it actually contains tea or not you know you might choose lemon and ginger you might choose chamomile or cherry or, or something like that you know there's a lot a whole range of different things that you potentially could use now some people do it by actually sort of i've seen people like um pour the gin into like a little beaker and then add the botanicals and sort of mix it to get the infusion which is one way of doing it but you might get bits in that but actually the the, the tea bag is a good cheap alternative for doing and, that and of course that changes the color too right and so and so i think you know talking about talking about the theater of it there's theater of course being able i mean part of the theater might be watching that bartender actually do that that muddle that that kind of all the I menu infusion right there in front of you but part of the theater maybe if you're not at a bar but if you're seated at a table and you're being served on a nice posh bar cart or something like that would be seeing the approach of the drink and knowing that you've ordered a gin tonic but it's that's not the color i was expecting ooh there's there's like yeah. a, a bit of delight in that surprise so i love the tea bag hack but also as i think about you know i'm thinking about the differences between my american notion of the the ice cold the very tall but somewhat neutral and effervescent gin and tonic and, and what we've just been describing. And one of the key differences for me is there's, it's a, as you mentioned, it's a double pour. There's all this ice and there's a lot of volume. And so when I think of things in the glass, I think of that drink changing over time, like as oh. it sits, the ice melts. So it becomes a little bit like it, it evolves from when it first arrives before you to when you take the last sip. And almost like I've seen amazing pictures where they'll actually throw some juniper berries in because as you know, we're, uh, is, is juniper in retrograde still is, is juniper becoming ascendant once again in gins now? I don't know, but we definitely I, spent about a decade where it was in retrograde there. 
Yeah, I think it is in its ascendancy again. There's been a few times where it's peaked up again. Certainly, certainly, I'm finding the, with flavoured gins that I'm tasting, um, we're getting more where you actually still can taste the gin underneath, which is good. Yeah, but I, I've I've seen amazing photos of just like actual juniper berries in the glass, and of, and of course, you know, as they if you do a decent job stirring it up, you you've got this beautiful appearance of all these ice cubes kind of packed together, but then you see a juniper berry every now and again, and they're kind of nestled in there. And that doubtless infuses into the cocktail itself. So I'm, I'm trying to, one of the, one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation so badly is that, I mean, can you think of any other cocktail that underwent such a, almost like a mutation where it split off from the way we thought about drinking it? Well, we can ignore, I think, for the fact that in the UK and in the US, there were different ways of drinking gin tonics. But can you think of any other drink that almost like split off from the mother cell and became its own thing that looked so vastly different? Yeah, I think um, probably think of two. One would be uh, the margarita versus the frozen margarita. I think there's a sufficient variation in there because uh, almost to an extent like if you order a margarita and you expect anything about whether you want it up or on the rocks and you get a frozen margarita that's different you get a strawberry frozen <laughs> margarita like you're you're totally different you know you're somewhere else right. um maybe also the martini versus the martini on the rocks given that that is more and more you know, I think the more I think about that, the more I think about that as a drink in its own right. It's not a martini. Mm. It's it sits it sits separately. I think the mood. We we can talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's well, my answer to one of your other questions, so we'll talk about it then. <laughs> I see, I see, I see. Uh, or, or like, so so as not to spoil your answer to the question, even even just the the vodka martini or the dirty martini, the kangaroo cocktail. In yeah. it, you know, if you think of an original martini as gin, vermouth, and a twist, <clears> you know. Some vodka and olive juice is not bad. No, no, that's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah. Um, interesting. Well, uh, so talk to us about Gin Tonica because you created this book as a tool to help people explore this new way of thinking about and making gin tonic. And so, like, so if our listeners are like, ooh, this is interesting, this sounds like something I'd like to play with, especially as we're you know, the, the days are getting longer and, and, and long drinks are starting to be on our minds again. How is it set up? What was the, what was your kind of, uh, thinking in how to use this as a tool to explore this format? So it's set, um, in the same way as the, as the Negroni book is set. Um, so we have four chapters. One is looking at more sort of classic style. One looks at more contemporary. There's a seasonal section and then an experimental section, which kind of has the fun one. So like, um, I think one of the experimental ones has a bit of blue curacao in it. And, uh, and then it's garnished with Swedish fish, the candies and rosemary. So it's kind of a take on the idea. People refer to the Copa glass as like a goldfish bowl. It's like, okay. You want to do a goldfish bowl? Let's do a goldfish bowl. And so, <laughs> so that's one of the sort of the the fun ones. I mean, like the curacao adds a little bit of orangey sweetness, and that's kind. Of, but a lot of it is about you know is about the look of it. And then other ones where you've got like ones with like uh, you know tea or maybe using a different sort of mixer and those kind of things. Um, so it really it's it's I like to see it as a starting point because you can see all right he's used. Earl Grey as a tea to infuse this. Oh, well, what if I use Lapsang Souchon? He's added this type of scotch to it, or he's done a rinse or something of this type of scotch. What if I use an Irish whiskey, or what if I use this other, a bourbon, or what if I use... And and it's kind of that. Like, we talk about particular brands for the gins and the tonics, but it, they're all designed that they can pretty much work with a sort of standard kind of gin i mean i'm kind of like if it works for tanker eh, like that's that's a good kind of starting point i think like something that people can get wherever you know something that's pretty standard and all those recipes in there they, it might not be the perfect in my mind combination but they will still work and they'll still be very tasty and that's kind of the um, we've got ones that have a little bit of a nod to the negroni and things like that in there as well of course 
Yes, for the for those of you who haven't haven't uh, <clears throat> checked out our interview uh, with Kelly with our friend Kelly Rivers about about the Negroni book, that's that's certainly a, a must listen. We'll link to that in the show notes page, of course. Um, so. Yeah, I, I like I like that as a starting point. And and those to to be honest, those are my favorite kinds of cocktail books because at this point there's a cocktail book on most everything in the cocktail canon and so the question isn't like all right, can you tell us the history of this? Can you tell us the tools we need to make it? The the real question to me is how can I use this as a jumping off point to evolve my own sort of play and work in the space. And, and so I, I, I do appreciate that about the book. So again, there will be a link to that over on the show notes page. Um, yeah, yeah, I would say, um, sorry, I was going to say, would say there isn't much history in it. So uh, um, it's, just, it's not the book it is. It's very much designed to be a, a practical book for home use. And we've tried hard to not have too many stupid ingredients in there because that frustrates me greatly. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the thing that you can only source at the, uh, you know, at, at, at the, at, at a single store in London. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think to me, just, I, I wanted to kind of, now that we've done some history, we've done some, some technique, I kind of wanted to zoom out and, and give you my overall take on the Spanish style gin tonic and see if you have any additions, modifications, other thoughts on it. But to me, you know, it, it seems to be a different, we, we might call it a subspecies of the gin and tonic, largely to me because of the playfulness of it. And the um, w where I see the gin and tonic in the 20th century as being a sort of restrained drink, almost, almost a subdued drink, when you think about no ice and warm, potentially slightly flat tonic and little citrus in the UK, you know, there's a reason why in the song Piano Man, there's an old man sitting next to him making love to his tonic and gin. Like it's, it's not a sexy drink, but the Spanish style, very sexy and yeah. very playful. And, and, and so to me, it seems like, you know, like I, like I mentioned earlier, it's almost like the gin and the tonic are taking a bit of a back seat to the botanicals and the flourishes and the garnishes and the theater at first. But I think the crucial point to, to make here is that I think that that's a bit of a mistake because we live in a time when there's so many amazing gins. So like, I think the temptation with people who might be starting out to play with like this new format of gin and tonic, either at home or if they're maybe newish bartenders who haven't, you know, had a decade behind the stick, the temptation is going to be to focus almost solely on those flourishes, those sexy bits and have the gin and the tonic be an afterthought. But I think the real opportunity as you're alluding to here is sure. Will it work with most gins? Yes. But to me, the real exciting part is like, ooh, all right, I've got my, I've got my note, I've got my concept. I know how I want this to look. Now, what is the best gin for this? So I don't know. That's kind of where I've landed on it as like my ideal version of what I think this format is good at. Do you agree? Disagree? Thoughts? No, I think I think that's <clears throat> I think that's very very true. I think it's no coincidence that the uh, as a style it's taken off. At the same time when in Europe there's been a huge amount of new gins enter the market and people using botanicals and they have flavor profiles that we've never had before. And I think, you know, if we just had like lots and lots of classic London dry gins and that was all we had, I don't know that we would have got to this point where we are. But, you know, when people are like, I want to have a more herbaceous um gin i want to have a fruitier gin i want some smoky gin or a savory gin and all these different aspects this helps to encourage the um uh, the experimentation really uh and some stuff's daft i mean i um <laughs> on a on a very early trip to spain it wasn't even it was a it was relatively small town so it wasn't like madrid or barcelona but this is how pre prevalent it'd been and it wasn't even a bar it was a like a frozen yogurt shot ice cream place, but they had they did gin tonic at a bar. So I said, oh, I have gin tonic, and the woman was like, "Oh, I'll do the, this this fancy style." And um, so she got the bottle of tonic water, and a lot of the tonic water in Spain has like a crown cap on the top, like you get on a beer bottle. You know, sometimes you have to have a bottle open, and sometimes you can sure. twist it off. And she had a 
seven or eight inch kitchen knife with a sharp point at the end. And she held the bottle and she had the, the knife in her other hand and she jabbed the top of the bottle to make a tiny hole in the cap. Then she had the big glass. She held it in one hand. She held the bottle of, of uh, uh, tonic water up in the air about three or four feet away, tilted it towards the glass, gave it a shake, and the there's a thin stream of tonic water shoots this sort of four or five foot into this glass that she can catch because the glass is so big. And that was, I mean, it takes all the fizz out of the glass. But when you talk about theatre, don't do it at home. It's very dangerous. Yes. Yeah. That's, <laughs> this is a disclaimer I didn't think that we have to put on this episode. I didn't think there were going to be any medical or safety warnings. <laughs> certainly, certainly not an OSHA violation of that, of that magnitude. Uh, you, that does remind me, though, of, you know, we were talking about the Basque country of the, uh, when they tap those enormous kegs of the sparkling cider mm. and they have the, the they you're, they have a, almost like a line of people, but catching that thin stream of pressurized liquid actually is that's a, it's a weird thing to say that's very Spanish, but it is very Spanish in that respect. Um, I think they call it a choch. I think that that's the, yeah, that's I think the, you're right. Yeah, not drawn that uh, not drawn that link before, but uh, I mean there are the, there are actually specific little safe gadgets that you can just put on the top and it punches a tiny hole. You don't need to use a big hmm. knife to do it. Well, there wow. are safe ways of doing it. <laughs> Doesn't re- it looks good? It looks good. That's it. It doesn't taste great because yeah, no, there's no fizz. Sure, sure. And as as we know, as as we've discussed in the past, like you know, any any sort of any sort of highball <clears throat> drink, the, the fizz is is the key. Uh, well, I I wanted to to wrap out this conversation about the gin and tonic with with maybe a slightly more general conversation about gin because that's something that you and I have had the opportunity to bond on a number of times and. I've had the opportunity to uh, even work with some distillers here in the U.S. formulating some some gins, and I've seen the trends going in certain directions. I've had the chance to talk to people about you know what they, where they think gin is heading, but I, I don't know that you and I have had the conversation of like I mentioned earlier is 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 Juniper still in retrograde? What is the governing identity of the craft gin space right now? I just I don't know that I have a very good pulse on it. Do, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I guess it kind of depends on where you're talking about. That's so, like, where what things are going on in the U.S. versus what's going on in the rest of the world is a uh, is a uh, yeah. I, I I find I think I mean there's a whole load of reasons for it, but um, I there's some fantastic gins in the U.S. and in many ways, um, American gin was was far in advance of what other people were doing. When you think about like in like the nineties when Junipero came out and you think about things like 209 and Guy Rehorse, you know, these fantastic gins that were the first gins to not necessarily be truly classic, but they were, you know, slightly doing things in their own kind of way. Um, and like the U S is, was way ahead with that. But then when you kind of look at like how many U S gins are in all of the states or something like that, or what are the gins that sell really well in the U S and stuff? There's just, I don't know the traction. I mean, you've got a lot of great booze in the U S so I guess maybe that's it. It's the competition from everything else. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just kind of feel like where the gin market was now and where it was 10 years ago in the U S I think there has been some movement, but not as much as I've seen elsewhere. Whereas other places I see it's truly exploded. So, you know, uh, South America going, you know, it's just superb gins coming from out there and, and, and lots of different ones. And gin is really becoming more and more popular. So like, I think like Brazil is, uh, you know, that is really growing. They like the, the Spanish style gin and tonic in Brazil as well. Um, Asia, I'm starting to see a lot more, some very good gins coming out of China, but also India, India is doing some really great stuff. And then, and then Australia is just a powerhouse, right? Australian gin. And I know you can get four pillars in, um, Pulpit is probably available in more states than some really great US gins, I would guess. I mean, they do a great job, but like, you know, and you see stuff like Four Pillars and they, and they, and they're doing a fantastic job with their spirits and their range. But, you know, there's hundreds of distilleries in Australia, uh, all doing interesting things, interesting botanicals to play with. You, you've got this ability for people to taste plants and flavors that 
unless they travelled there, they probably never would get to taste. But now, you know, Taz, um, uh, like uh, finger limes or something like. Although to be fair, I did actually have finger limes in San Francisco because they weren't growing. But nevertheless, you know, things like finger limes and lemon and all these kind of weird botanicals that are just local to a particular place. Which unless you go there, you probably won't get to try. You now can try and travel through the medium of gin. So I think the internal internationalization of gin is the big thing and that is good in two ways because it means that as consumers in the countries that we're in we're getting more choice and then also for our producers there's other markets where you know think people can export to so like you know Brazil's a big market for gin. Okay, so they're going to want to drink some of their local gin, but hey, maybe they want to drink a gin from California. Maybe they want to drink a mm-hmm. gin from Texas or DC or New York or wherever, you know. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and it, it kind of makes me think of the notion of, you know, as opposed to a time capsule where you can open something up and, and feel transported to another time, gin in the way that you just described is almost like a place capsule. It's yeah. where you can bottle it up, ship it off somewhere and have that sense of transport. And I think to me, that's what a great cocktail or, you know, even if it's just a straight, you know, a straight pour of something, that's, that's what a great experience is to me. It, it evokes that sense of, of place, that, that sense that uh, you are, wherever you are drinking it is all right. Well, I'm not, I'm not just here anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm smelling the, you know, the, the peat of, of Isla or, you know, what have you. And so I think botanicals are, are a great, a great tool for that. And, uh, I, it, it reminds me of something that we just reviewed recently, which, which was, uh, a gin from Mississippi Wonderbird gin. Ah, and yes. I believe you had a, a hand in that, right? Yes. <laughs> Get your people reminded me. Um, I, 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 I think they were very generous with what they said on the website. Um, but they, they were, they were someone that came to one of my classes. Um, in, um, it was in Portland. So it would have been, I think we had Todd there, but we also had the great Lauren Pats. Uh, she would have been one of our instructors yes. at the same time. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, we, we talked, you know, with these classes, we talked to people about, you know, what their kind of ideas are, but, uh, I mean, if, if I gave them some help, then fantastic. And, and the gin is brilliant. I've tried it, and it's fantastic. And I'm very happy, and any help I can be, I will. But I can't really take any credit for anything, I'm afraid. Um, but they did a great job. And rice is not easy to work with. A rice-based gin, not easy to do. Um, it was done before. There was one done, like, 10 years ago, and it just wasn't a very clean base. But those guys have done a fantastic job. Right. Well, and so this is, I, I didn't have this on my list of questions for you, but it, it does occur to me that I've been meaning to ask you about this. What do you think, and I know that this is a little bit backwards in terms of the, the actual logic, maybe it doesn't make any sense at all, but do you ever think about distillate base as a gin botanical? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, and that's actually kind of one of the fun things about us gin um is that there's a lot more people making their own base book because they want to make their vodka or they want to make um whiskey or something like that whereas in the uk and in europe it's a lot less common most people are buying in the neutral spirit one is not better than the other but obviously there's things that you can kind of play with there's some very minor technical well, they're not minor if you if you need to if you want to obey the law, but there are some technical issues about why it's actually slightly easier to to make a base spirit in the U.S. as opposed to in the in in Europe. You don't have to distill it to quite as high. Um, but yeah, the other way that you can you can do this either you can have it as your as your your base, or what you can do is you can um, use the neutral base and then maybe add a bit of distillate post distillation. You can't call it London Dry Gin in that case uh, because you've added something afterwards. But you could do that because if you, for most gins, you have to distill it to quite a high ABV, make it basically very, very pure, a bit like vodka to make the base. And if you do that, you'll strip out a lot of character. So, you know, that's part of the reason why like whiskies and brandies and things are so great and so flavoursome is that they're not distilled to a really high ABV. So a lot of the character that would otherwise be stripped out remains. So if you made a beautiful cherry eau de vie or something, you might just add a splash in your gin afterwards. And that mm. would be what you would do. I mean, these, the guys, the guys, um, 
uh, in Mississippi, they are that's their base spirit, and and they do a very good job of it. Um, um, I imagine. Yeah, just uh, can't quite imagine having to deal with all that rice through the fermentation. So it must get quite messy. Yes, yes, I'm sure it does. It's probably just just beneath rye in terms of messiest yes, things to work with. Yes, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> uh, well, David, uh, I, as I mentioned, we're going to link to Gin Tonica and uh, your other interviews over on the show notes page for folks to go explore there. But uh, for anybody who's curious about just keeping tabs on what you're up to, uh, before we jump into the lightning round here, how can people stay in touch with you in the, like the digital space? Yeah, so the website is uh, summerfruitcup.com. Not updated as much as I would like, but then that, I think that's what happens to all of us. But you can go back and see all of the crazy stuff I did. 10 years ago, um, which is, I still get it. Sometimes I go, oh, I really wish I could do more stuff like that. Cause that was great. You know, these weird experiments we do great. It was great fun. Um, oh, I, did some, I did something the other day with margaritas and different orange liqueurs. That was quite fun. Um, mm. and I did put that on the website actually. Um, it's an at summer fruit cup on, um, Twitter. I think we're at distilling expo on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You're a man with many hats. Oh, yeah, exactly. many, in, in your case, many waistcoats. Short attention span is another way of putting it, but you put it lovely. <laughs> you put it in a nice way. <laughs> okay, well, let's uh, let's jump into a quick lightning round. Because you've been a, a prior guest, I had to work up a few different questions for you, but um, we'll start with a standard one. A desert island scenario, interpret it as you like. You get one bottle, one straight pour to take with you um, with no prospect of rescue and one cocktail that we can assume is like on draft or you have all the materials to make it what's what's your bottle and what's your cocktail um so right and i did i've not gone back to see what my previous answers were so my bottle is going to be um uh old granddad bottled in bond it's going to be my choice can't get it in the uk it's just as well because it doesn't last long when it when i'm here yeah. I, I also i i quite enjoy that and i'd quite like that as a um a mint julep it works very nicely. And if I haven't got mint, you know, if I fancy mint a uh, mint julep at eleven o'clock at night and I have no mint, I use a three mint tea bag and it works very well. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. There you go. Not um, my cocktail would be the martini on the rocks, <laughs> as I alluded to previously. Um, and I get the ice then as well because it has to be martini. There's no pouring a martini on the rocks. You've got to have the, the ice there. So. Right. So, so to, to take us through why you why you like the martini on the rocks is sort of like a, a slightly uh, a slightly naughty take on the, the classic. <laughs> it's the thinking thinking person's martini. It's the yeah, martini. On the rocks. It's more contemplative. You sort of sit there and it changes over time. Um, <laughs> and this is why with your collective nouns, I said it was a pretension of martinis. <laughs> it's got to be. Um, I, I do. I, I like it. Um, uh, I think it's it's quite. You know, you still have to put effort into making it. You need the right glass and and that. But I just think I just, I like that slightly more contemplative aspect to it. If you're having it sort of in the afternoon or it's really hot, yes, you're going to get a little bit more ice melt. So it's not going to have. It's not going to be quite so hard hitting. There's a there's definitely a time for a real like pure crisp martini. But I think if I'm having more than one, I like something just a little bit more relaxed. Um, and then also you have slightly less of an issue of the martini getting warm. Um, mm. Because when you've got the, you know, it depends on how big your martini glass is. But if you have a really large martini glass, sort of four, you know, three ounces or four ounces or something like that, it, that last bit of martini is not much fun. You want smaller glasses, really. So that's part right. of the reason as well. I like that. I, and, and and if and if their vermouth's not very good, if you're ordering it in a bar and you think, oh, the vermouth's bar, then you've got like gin or vodka on the rocks, which is could be a lot worse <laughs> <laughs> with some olives in it. <laughs> oh yes, yes, please. Um, I lo it's uh, so unfortunate that this is a conversation all about gin and tonics because the thinking person's martini is a great episode title. So I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to save that for a future. Well, conversation. I've, I've got a book coming out in uh, May on the martini, me and Kelly. So. Brilliant. In yes, the same so, style. <laughs> yes, I was going to say. So, so for those of you who haven't listened to the first interview, we'll you'll definitely have to go check that out because it was a very, I don't, 
we'll have we'll have to we'll have to talk in a, in a few months if, if we're all in the same room together about about how we how we should uh how we should approach this book because uh yeah that conversation with you and kelly was was uh, was so much fun um so next next question i have for you uh this is inspired by a recent trip that i took where i used a, a flower a flower vase and a chopstick to uh stir up a batch of negronis for my father-in-law and i uh so what is the strangest vessel you've ever mixed a cocktail in could be stirred, could be shaken. I was, I was tr really trying to think about this. Um, cause it turns out that I tend to just use weird stuff anyway. Um, <laughs> so I don't like, if I'm doing a stirred drink, I don't use a bar spoon. I use either, depending on where I am, a chopstick. Cause I like, I think I like a chopstick. I think it just works better. Occasionally I <laughs> use, um, a knitting needle or a crochet hook, depending on where I am. I think yesterday I was making something and I had like a very long, like plastic piece of Lego that was some spare bit from something. So I used that. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I was not expecting that. I was like, okay, knitting needles, chopstick, Lego. Whoa. Okay. Um, that's brilliant. I love that. Uh, and then the final question we have here, um, tasting notes. Now you have a lot of experience, uh, setting up judgings and, you know, interfacing with people who give these tasting notes. There, there are good tasting notes. There are bad tasting notes and there, then there are some that are just bizarre. So what is the strangest tasting note that you, that you can think of that either you, you've, you identified yourself or that, that somebody else identified in a spirit? I, um, very occasionally, for me, I get um, a taste of what I think is blood plasma. So, you know, if you ever cut yourself and you get that slightly like straw colored liquid that comes through and you taste it and it's slightly creamy and slightly sort of irony, occasionally get that in a spirit. Okay. okay. <laughs> but I will, but in addition to that, just cause to move away from the biological stuff, I was, um, <laughs> I've, I've recently been writing a lot of tasting notes up, like, um, sort of three people's worth of tasting notes and I was digest, digesting them into one. And I was playing around with this, um, I've forgotten the name of it now. What's this chat I, AI thing? Chat GTP, uh, oh, whatever it is. You, you know what I'm saying? Yes. GPT, yeah. So I was playing around with that and I was like, oh, this is, and, and it's kind of one of those things where you're like, is this going to put me out of a job? Or is this going to make my life easier? Because I asked it to write a tasting note in a haiku, and it came up with it. <laughs> or it is a limerick, and it didn't. And I thought, well, that's... And actually, I did. I, I found this out once I'd done all 300 of these tasting notes. But I found out if I put the text in and said, write me a 25-word consolidated <laughs> tasting note, it would do it for me. Now, of course... It was sometimes it was a bit mean about what it said. So you still need someone to spare people's feelings by adjusting it. But I was like, it was interesting. And I, I think I'll be playing around with using it for some more stuff. I think use it as a tool with others. I mean, it can't, it can't taste for you. You still need to taste. But if you, you know, was, well, you know, you, you write tasted notes and you know, when you're judging, I mean, you couldn't really do it if you were judging, but like, if you, when you've written a lot of tasting notes, you're like, do I just sound the same? Mm. And you find yourself trying to go on thesaurus and find some word that's the same as this. So, um, yeah, I'm intrigued as to where these things will lead us. Yeah, that's brilliant. Well, yes. Re remember kids chat GPT can be your friend, but, but it can't taste your booze for you. So, so no. don't, don't try and, uh, don't try and, and, uh, you know, douse your, douse your laptop in, in your favorite gin. So don't pour play. it in the floppy drive. Right. Right. <laughs> there's, a, there's a contemporary reference. <laughs> exactly. Well, on the well, modern David, bar cart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll link to that for all of our Gen Z, uh, all of our Gen Z listeners. We'll, I'll, I'll send you a link so that you can figure out what we just talked about. But, uh, David, thank you so much for sharing your time, your expertise. Uh, Gin Tonica, of course, is a legacy publication, and we are very much looking forward to the Martini book in May. So um, I sense that this may not be the last we hear from you. And uh, thank you so much for being my guest here on the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. Eric, it's always a pleasure. And thank you for everybody for listening.